I'm Tracy Fieber with Acquired Insights, and we're going to try to bring everything that you've kind of heard today together into a business perspective, okay? So what we do with artificial intelligence, machine learning, predictive analytics, is we integrate it into the business. So we've brought together different partners, and we go into a company and really create the project, do project management, and make sure that you're meeting your business imperatives. So if you think about the law of diffusion, most people um, know that there's the first area, which is the innovators, then we have the early adopters, the early majority, late majority, and the laggards. Right now, artificial intelligence, machine learning, predictive analytics, we're really in that early majority stage, right? 34%. You're seeing more and more uh, the terms come into some of the publicity that's out there, the media. If you take a look at in the oil field, oil and gas, there's some companies that have started it. Some are having some success. Some are having to go back to the drawing board. And that's where we kind of come in is a lot of times people have already started to integrate business intelligence, but they haven't necessarily taken it to that next stage of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and predictive analytics. So here's a quote um, from the John Chambers. He's the executive chairman of Cisco. If you don't transform, if you don't reinvent yourself, change your organization structure, if you don't talk about speed of innovation, uh, where it'll be brutal, you'll have brutal disruption, right? We've seen in the oil and gas industry, there has been a lot of disruption. Since 2014, we've been waiting for it to come back. We know that it's not going to come back the same way, but how is it going to be different? And that's where artificial intelligence can come in to help you to now restructure what it is that you're going to need going forward. There's two types of data. One is structured data, and you've heard today some of the different systems that can, can use the data. A lot of that is the structured data. Where we really shine is that unstructured data, right? So if you think about all of the databases that you have, that's the structured information. What about all of the texts that happen? The text messages, the social, right? All of the other information that's out there, the meetings that are held that are or are not being recorded, the ideas that come from a meeting, and two years later they could use that information, or six months later, but that, that information's lost. The people have moved on, right? So that's the unstructured data. Voice recordings, voice to text, audio, you can see all of those. I'm not going to go, and go through all of them. MNO is mobile network operators, so Think about Google Analytics. You can take a look at you know, where is it that the people have come from, uh, how are they coming, all of these sort of information. So why is it, it important to have that unstructured information? Well, I can tell you, IBM had a statistic a few years ago. 90% of today's data has been created in the last two years, and 90% of that is unstructured. Is that a believable statistic? I think so. If you think of social media and all of the different ways that people are now communicating. Since businesses generally use the structured data, that means that they're really only using about 20% of the data that's within an organization. What about all of the expertise that's in what someone's head? Is that being recorded? Is there any way to use that information? Right? And that's where we're starting to see that it's important to have the expertise, especially more and more people are nearing that you know, baby boomer age, right? So people are starting to leave the organization or start a new career or all sorts of things. You're losing that information. This is the unstructured information. We've created an app that can actually capture that, be used with the structured information that's already there, and bring artificial intelligence and machine learning into it. So the world's most valuable resource is no longer oil, but data. Now I know you're in the oil field and you don't want to hear that. But what happens if we start to bring the data and the information from the oil together? How can that change? So think about that importance in the world, how all of the information that has been used, whether it's onshore, offshore, above ground, below ground, all of that information, yes, the data's there. It's not necessarily that we need to capture more data, but we need to now capture that unstructured data and bring it together with the structured data. So what keeps oil and gas executives up at night? Well, we've brought it into three different categories. Upstream, there's the innovation and the exploration. I know that this doesn't cover everything, right? My husband's been in the oil field for 35 years uh, since we've been married, and 
I know it's changed a lot in all, all of those years. But how is it going to change now with technology? Technology can be the thing that can help companies to recover from everything that's happened. Increased production, oil recovery rates, midstream. We have the expectations of distribution growth. We have high competitive intensity driving down the returns, the management and investor group alignment and on value propositions. And then there's downstream. We need more efficient, flexible, integrated refineries to meet the increasing regulatory compliance. Right? Just because of the downturn doesn't mean regulation has stopped. And that's a tough thing. Regulation costs a lot of money, and yet you need to continue to do it. There's still uh, deadlines that have to be met. There's still, uh, you know, you've got dates for things to be drilled by, or else you have some compliance issues, right? Environmental issues. Production growth and cost of supply. The corporate communication and timely flow of accurate information to determine the efficiency in the various processes. So all of these things, whether it's upstream, midstream, downstream, some of these actually go across different streams, right? It's not necessarily only that upstream that it applies to. It's actually across the streams. So we've got some industry-wide concerns, some cost-cutting measures. We know that since 2014, we've done all the cost-cutting that we can do, right? We can't cut anymore. How do we get, how do we get past that? How do we continue to survive? Uh, the market and price volatility, we all know about that, right? What's our oil worth? What about the pipeline? We can't help to build the pipeline, but we can certainly help with the information. Raising the capital, dilution, uh, cost of equity, earnings per share, right? All of those things are things that are concerns to everyone. The cash optimization with respect to the standards, the heightened geopolitical risk, health, safety, environment management, uh, corporate social responsibility, and the shortage of technical talent and the capability. So as I said, as people are leaving the industry, retiring, deciding to go into another a career, we, we're losing that information. And if you think about, we need to start capturing that. That's that unstructured information, right? We want to be able to have that information within the company because that's part of the assets, it's the knowledge. So everybody's asking the question, what types of AI applications are currently in use in the oil and gas industry? Is there something that we can go off of or some way that you can help us? What are the tangible results of some of the AI ML and the predictive analytics? What is it doing for us, right? Uh, are there common trends among the innovation efforts, right? So remember I said where we are in that curve, we're at that early adopter and innovator stage. How could the trends affect the future of oil and gas? So that's where, if you think about predictive analytics, it's the prediction that we can also help with, right? So it's not only going on past, it's going on what's happening now and what impacts will these have and how do we need to now make a different decision, right? Remember, when we're looking at things, we can only think within our own experience and our own realm of possibility. And sometimes we need the machine learning to be able to show us different possibilities. And when we see them, a lot of times you say, oh yeah, well that makes perfect sense. But did you think of that? And how long would it have been before you did think of that? So the future isn't in the future, right? It's not that you know, AI is in the future, artificial intelligence, all of these things, it's coming. No, it's not coming, it's now. We're seeing that it's already now. Here's a quote from the senior director of the energy and natural resources industries. The promise of AI is already being realized in the oil and gas industry. Early adopters are taking advantage of their position to get a head start on the competition and protect their assets, right? So as competition in the oil and gas industry continues to heat up, companies can't afford to be left behind. You need to be getting into it now and finding out whether it's a small project or a large project, you need to start to do it now. And the reason being, you're going to get left behind. Yes, it's tough because of all that's happened. And yet we, as you'll see a little bit later, we show ROI fairly quickly. Uh, compared to projects you know, years ago where you had two year implementations, et cetera, and keep on going, we don't have to do that anymore. Technology has allowed us to be able to have faster implementation, so you get to your return on investment a lot faster. So the adoptable predictable technologies for the upstream. So there's exploration, finding those pools, right? We can take all of the data, the production optimization, analyzing the seismic and the subsurface data faster to locate some new reserves, the intelligent robots that are out there, 
um, using them in hydrocarbon exploration and production. The predictive analytics to detect acoustic changes, um, patterns, so it can be we've got an app that somebody can actually take and have it record or listen to what a machine is doing. And by feeding that in and having other information fed in, it can then predict what's going to happen. When you know how sometimes some, uh, um, some of the pumps, let's say, the pump might be making a funny noise, right? The person may recognize that, but it could be that you have it listened to and then the system can tell you what's going on. Does it need to be repaired or replaced or, you know, flushed or what is it, right? The development, how to get the oil, the oil and gas out. So minimizing the downtime, the predictive maintenance for oil and gas equipment, the reserve, reservoir understanding and modeling, predicting the oil corrosion so that you can reduce the maintenance costs. Right? We're all into, yeah, we want to cut costs in any way, but we also want to grow. We also want to have that income, not just cut expenses. AI-enabled platforms that have better control over rates of penetration, enhancement. And then there's the production and drilling capacity. This is where you reduce the on-site operating costs by using the sensors. So all of the data, whether it's structured data in the sensors and everything else that is out there that's in a company, in an ERP system, in an HR, uh, uh, HRIS system, whether it's your CRM, your customer relationship management system, any of the information that you have that is structured information can now be combined with unstructured information. And it can give you a more robust picture and glean better insights. So what about in the midstream? Well, midstream we have the field processing, including the fractionation plants. Uh, you can maintain close, accurate tabs on the production flow and the quality of it, the, provide a better foundation for production reporting. In the transport, and I'll tell you a little bit about a transport company in a little bit, um, crunching multiple data sources to pinpoint the risk for pipeline integrity management. Uh, now you know that there are sensors out there that you can send in that can feed data back and we can take that and use it with other information and even do the predictive analytics machine learning so that you can see, okay, was it that this pipe burst, um, you know, northern BC recently, right, a pipe burst. And so what was the cause of that? Could it have been predicted? Could it have been avoided? Was it the freezing and thawing that caused it and it did it so many times? Was it the weather, right? What was it? All of that information, the weather data, all of the, the um, information that's available publicly or whether you pay for the, for the information, all of it can be brought in and taken into consideration for these things. Uh, the real-time data collection to deduct, detect transmission line leaks, the 3D printing, of the assets used for maintenance planning and execution, the storage, bulk terminals, right? Holding tanks, underground reservoirs. You can discover the crucial variances in process monitoring and measurement. And then we have the downstream, okay? So in the downstream, the platforms uh, to deliver a centralized method of data management, data integration to manage the factory operations, predictive analytics to measure the pressure, the temperature, the flows, and the processing rates. So all of those things, yes, some of that data you already have, we can now have it so that it's real-time data and you can actually have it so that the system will notify you and not just you have to query it. So think about a Siri. Right now, you know, with a Siri, you have to query it and then an answer comes back, right? With our system, you don't necessarily have to query it. It can send you information without you even querying it, okay? So then there's transportation, the autonomous self-driving vehicles that they say are coming, the supply chain management, the environmental sustainability, and then the marketing. Um, selling and distributing, so streamlining the refinery and petroleum delivery operations to accelerate the revenue growth and accurate models and forecasts based on operating performance, scenario an analysis, and market trends. So what are some tangible results? in the uh, oil and gas industry? Well, the first one is trucking and transportation. So there's a trucking company that has a video on every, in every vehicle. And what it does is when there's a hard braking incident, it's always continually rolling. But when there's a hard braking incident, it records 90 seconds before and 90 seconds after. 
And what the company's looking for is we want to see which ones are false positives because those we throw out. But is there a training that we need to do with the person? Is it mechanical? Is it maintenance? What is causing the hard braking, right? Is it somebody cutting somebody off? Is it the driver not driving according to the road conditions? What's happening, right? So they, want, they are recording all of these hard braking incidents 90 seconds before and 90 seconds after. And what they've said is we've tried to hire people in order to do that. And you know, we've been increasing the number. However, we have a high rate of burnout because those people are looking at all of these false positives and the actual ones to figure out how is it that we can figure out which ones are the ones, who needs training, what do we need to do next, right? They've got their procedures and processes that they need, know that they need to do, but about 80 to 90 percent are false positives. And so what we're doing is we're working with them to take out all of those false positives and also to be able to then take it so that the people um, don't have to necessarily decision what ne needs to do next. There's only certain circumstances that they need that expertise. So this is helping them because they can't keep people in that position because they said people get bored, they want to move on, they want to be more challenged, right? And, and it's making it so that they don't have to go through all of these hours and hours of data, hours and hours of heartbreaking incidents that are 90 seconds before and 90 seconds after, and take a look and say, okay, you know, only 10%, let me find my 10%, right? Uh, the current and historical data sources with AIML. So there's projects with historical surveys. Some of the, some of the projects are taking one or two of these things, and others are, are taking uh, each one individually. So it might be a project that's with historical surveys, and we're taking a look and seeing, okay, how can we make it so that these uh, historical surveys are better utilized? Right? right now we have them, we use them in a certain way. What are other ways, what are other insights that we can see that we hadn't thought of? Then drilling and platform results in the records, the well logging reports, the marine seismic, the geophysics reports, um, the thermal imaging, weather reports. So all of these things can now be used, right? So here's some of the things that happen when we do projects. We've seen decrease the time to detection. We uh, decrease equipment downtime, the maintenance costs, decrease the repair costs, increasing things like straight through processing, productivity, uh, increasing profitability, improving process automation, right? So sometimes we can, we can uh, sh short, short stream something or take out steps in order to get from here to there because those steps really don't add value along the way. Uh, improve the seismic analysis, improve the delivery of capital projects. And here is just an example. We have models and modules, and we have a lot of different modules, so things like an analytical data warehouse, we have a behavioral data warehouse, we have a decision engine, a customer journey management, all of these different modules. Now within those, we also have other models, which are uh, artificial intelligence or machine learning models, right, algorithmic models. We have things like straight through processing. We have robo-assist. We have an underwriter portion that can be used, not just when you think underwriter, you think of insurance or financial, but it can be used in many different industries in different ways. So we have over 100 models in our models library. What that allows us to do is have a fast implementation because we can take those models and put two or three together, and then we can actually custom code what else needs to be done and have a quick implementation. See things like subsurface data, uh, the telematics data, sensors, IoT data, right? All of those things. There's a lot of companies in the oil industry that have information and data, and yet they're not necessarily using it or using it to its full potential. The satellite, geolocation, the system logs data, a lot of those things are there, but they're not being used. So we need to innovate to survive. We need to add intelligence to the critical assets, right? Aggregate the data from multiple sources, bringing things together, structured, unstructured. Like I said, that's where we're a little bit different is because we can bring that unstructured information. A different decision, you would make a different decision if you had that information a lot of the times, okay? Improving oil well planning, streamlining event and field management, anomaly detection sensors, uh, bot and drone diagnostics. You know that some of these things are being used somewhat in the oil field or getting to be more and more. What about the information that comes from there? Is it just immediate that you use that information or is it put somewhere and never used again? Now we can use that information. 
we can resurrect it and take it into consideration when future decisions are being made. The monitor operating conditions of remote assets, interpreting the massive volumes of data. A lot of times you have a lot of data and you're not using it or you're only using it for one or two purposes. It could be used. Now other systems can talk to each other. Connect the outdated systems or processes, right? So think about a lot of times what we've heard from some people is, well, you know, we've got this version of this and we need to upgrade it before we do anything. And what we're saying is no, actually, to us it's all data. It doesn't matter which version you're on. The nice thing about artificial intelligence and machine learning and predictive analytics is it can take the information that you have and it can then build the system that you need. Automate and optimize data-rich processes. Increase speed to well site production. Uh, sense and respond to the demand. So it can take a look at how much demand is there. It can predict when is the demand going to hit, right? So take a look at all of the information that you have and you're not fully using yet. Uh, fleet management, we've got another company that is with the fleets. They're taking a look at how can we optimize the use of our fleets. Right? Is there predictive maintenance we can do? Is it, wh what is it that we can do to help to, yes, minimize costs, but make us more money? Increase insight into operations to reduce the exposure, the risk, and the liability. So things like safeguarding your assets, uh, maintaining the lean operations. So we've, in the last few years, we've all had to downsize and become lean, right? Cut a lot of different positions and processes and things that we do all sorts of things. Now, how do we grow from here and not get back to that? We want to make sure that we're maintaining that lean and not just growing because, you know, we're so busy and, and you're just throwing money at it. Analyze the economic conditions and the weather patterns to forecast demand. Uh, mitigate regulatory pressures. Replace highly repetitive and routine manual activities. So a lot of times, you know, people are asking me, well, will this replace people? And what I say is, sometimes it does, but most times the people are redeployed. And we actually have a system to be able to help with that as well. To take a look at, you know, what are your strengths and abilities and how can that fit or be redeployed in, in this company. Uh, customer focused application programming interface and then minimizing the carbon footprint. Now maybe we shouldn't talk about that carbon word, right? Especially now with all that's going on. And yet we want to make sure that we are minimizing that carbon footprint. So think about if we can start to see the ways to be able to do that, wouldn't that make it better for our company? So what's the future of the oil and gas industry? Well, the future, like I said, is now. This is a quote from a retired chairman of ConocoPhillips. The next generation of competitive advantage in the energy marketplace will go to forward thinking players who invest a lot on digital IoT and artificial intelligence capabilities. Right? He sees it, he's, he's retired, and yet with the JAG group that he's part of, the Chairman Emeritus, he's actually brought together some other retired people and they're going back and helping people to, to see how this can work. So the digital revolution, it is taking off in the oil and gas industry. The value of data is shifting from structured to unstructured. Uh, any and all highly regulated industries will be hit hard and fast because of the structured data. Legislation and policy are actually lagging and we actually have a lot of uh, different groups and regulators who are coming to us to ask us to help them to change or, or create some regulations. There's uh, ethics management because of artificial intelligence, etc. Some people have fear out there, right? And so they're, we're working with some different groups and departments that are asking us, okay, what from an ethics management perspective. We've created our own ethics management office within our company because we want to make sure that you know, AI is used for good and not evil. They're coming to us and saying, what are you doing? Can we work with you? Can we you know, have you help us figure out what these sort of policies should be? But if there's some that you don't like, don't blame me, okay? Um, so focus to identify fast and clear differentiation required between the background noise versus the value-added technology and partnerships. So how do you figure out what is background noise and what isn't? And then the early risk identification and management, so exception reporting. Remember earlier I said people are going to be looking at exceptions rather than at every little thing in that fast-breaking incident, right? They're looking at the exceptions. They're not having to look at the 80% unnecessarily. The use of AI 
ML used to accelerate move to root cause analysis and fast. So you can see what the root cause is instead of trying to guess what it is. And you can get there very quickly. Canada and US are actually far behind in the adoption. We are ha having the AI ML system and solution in other countries. And North America, I can tell you, is a little bit slower. So it's going to happen faster because regulations are coming. Regulations keep changing, right? And all that's happened within the whole oil and gas industry is being affected. So some quick stats. Uh, Cisco Consulting did a survey. And they said, you know, what is the top driver for the industry to invest in connected technologies? And you can see 32% said data analytics for faster, better decision making. 26% said improved operational efficiencies and 18% increased productivity. Now this was taken in 2015. So that was right after things had started to crash. People were still kind of optimistic, maybe next year, right? Maybe six months. And yet now if you think about, I believe that those numbers, if they were to redo that, the numbers would be higher because people are moving faster and recognizing that data and technology has to be used in a different way. Another stat. In which area does your company need to improve most to make effective use of connected technologies? And this, again, was 2015. 48% said data, leveraging the data for more effective decision making. So it's not that you don't have data. You have it. It's just a different way of using it, right? Or it might be adding to it. So think about, you know, if you can search the web or get a data feed from a known source, and you can bring that in and help with the decisioning that you have. You can bring in uh, weather information. You can bring in all of these s different satellite information that's out there. It's not just your data anymore. You can even do some peer information that's been published, right? And take that into consideration if that's what you want. Bring some of that data in that's publicly available. 28% said process, so delivering the right information to the right person or machine at the right time. 17% said the people, connecting people in more relevant and valuable ways. Uh, like you said, he, you know, he's different countries, right? So how do you connect the different countries and the information that's coming from the different countries? There's a project that was done in the US a few years ago, and what happened was the, um, one of the, the sensors wasn't working in a, one of the gauges. And so what it was doing was it was causing fireballs to be thrown up into the air. And it took them a period of time to find out what the actual root cause was. But in the meantime that it happened, they then did a plant shutdown. It took six months. Two years later, that same company had the same thing happen in a different area, different location. Why did that happen? Well, they said none of the normal people that were there you know, the regular people from before, they'd moved on, they were promoted, they moved to different locations, and so they didn't recognize the problem. If that was a known problem two years earlier, two or three years earlier, why was that not recognized here, right? Did that information not get transferred? What happened, right? So that's, that's where the system, the system can not only pull information or record information or give you an answer, it can tell you those things just by even listening. 7% said things, connecting the right machines and devices and equipment to capture useful data. So what if all the people, processes, technology, systems, divisions of your business could actually be fully integrated? Think of the impact that that would have on your company. What if you could gather and leverage any sort of data derived from behavioral, social, unstructured, structured, doesn't matter, and use it for real-time business decisions? What if you could reduce or even eliminate the threats to your business continuity? What if you could have foreseen what was happening in the oil field before, and then you could have adjusted sooner, right? Leaders, what if leaders had a direct uh, line of sight to the return to the shareholders? So what Artificial intelligence, machine learning, predictive analytics, what can it do for your business? Well, you know you're ready when you want the impact of a digital transformation to be minimized, right? You want it to not affect your company. Think about all of the different technological implementations that have happened and the company 
needs to shift to the way that the program or technology works, right? That's not necessary anymore because with artificial intelligence, it can learn how your company works and it can then take that information together, right? It doesn't have to be. Uh, one company that we're talking to, they, they have uh, people that are out in the field and you know the difficulty is, of course, getting the information from the field into the office, et cetera, and, and the whole process. With an app, they can record it. And instead of, instead of it, uh, me having to learn how to input it into here, right, learn the drop downs or how to put it into the system or whatever it is, the system learns how I do it. And then it learns how you do it. And it learns how you do it. And so that you can keep doing the things that you do the way that you do them. And, you don't have to conform to the way that that, that system works. Uh, you want to see results in weeks and not years. You want to implement AI, ML, which is artificial intelligence machine learning in a non-disruptive way. Uh, like I said, our implementations are usually fairly short. Uh, you're tired of vetting new grad AI, ML companies. We've had, we've been brought in a fair amount, whether it's a large company that couldn't perform or a smaller company that couldn't perform for various reasons. We've been brought into those sort of circumstances. So why choose us? Well, we have 250 uh, data scientists and mathematicians. We have uh, 20 years experience. Uh, we've partnered with different groups who have a lot of different experience. We're even working uh, right now with like Hanson Robotics to be able to bring our artificial intelligence into their robotics. Um, we have a 300 person year model library software that adapts to the customer behavior, which is what I was just saying. Operational perspective, well, the solution implements in days or weeks, and you start to see the ROI, the return on investment, within a few weeks. And then 100% ROI is usually within 12 months, right? So it's a fairly quick implementation, typically an implementation, depending, of course, size of the project, et cetera. Some companies start with a project. Some do it company-wide right away. It depends on what's right for you. Um, implementation, though, is usually within 9 to 12 months, tops, it's usually 6 to 9 months. And the solution then becomes self-funding. How many solutions can you say can do that, right? Organizational perspective, it's fully customizable. Remember, we've got the models and the modules, so we put them together and figure out what is it that this company needs and how do we do it, and then we customize it so, and add others and create along the way. Uh, it's non-disruptive implementation, so it used to be, like I said, that you know you had a whole team of people that came for months and months and months and, and really disrupted or you tried to work around them in your company. That's not the case. Typically, we come on site for a couple of weeks, then we go off site and do our thing, and then we come back and we deliver you know, what it is that either the proof of concept or implementation or what have you. Okay? So it's a fairly quick process. Our head of tech was the lead developer on SAP HANA. So he's got a lot of experience. This works with, it doesn't matter if it's SAP or Oracle, uh, you know, any of the other systems that are out there, we work with all of them. We have that experience. From an internal perspective, we have the focus on supporting the business practices. So we don't necessarily make you change business practices. If, if you have a desire to change business practice, practices, we can help with that. But that doesn't mean that you have to do that, okay? And then change management component, we always have that included. The project management component and then the human resources. So we recognize that people are important in a company and it's not that we need to you know, disrupt everybody. So here's a few different companies that we've done some work for, uh, whether it's been artificial intelligence, security, unstructured data. We're doing projects in these different companies. We also um, are doing cyber security and even getting some companies with crypto have come to us to say, you know, how can this work, et cetera. But our focus is really on oil and gas, financial services, healthcare, and telecom. So what are the next steps? Well, you need the tools, whether it's our tools or someone else's, right? You need to have things like, these are the ones that are most common in any implementation. We have a behavioral data warehouse. That's your unstructured information. We have a decision engine. We have a dynamic customer journey. And then you need experience because like we say, this is rocket science. It is how to bring it together for you that's customized. It's not gonna be that we implement for you and then we go to your competitor and we implement the same for them. That's not how this happens. This is yours, this is how you do it and somebody else does it differently. Remember, we're not making them come to our system. Our system goes to them. 
and then guidance. We use experience and insight to consistently convert uh, industry average business functions and management into key differentiators to drive newfound commercial value for you. So there's my contact information. Again, acquired insights. If you go to AIinc.cloud, that's our website. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Any questions? Who holds on to the data? Who holds on to the data? You do. Company does. Yeah, absolutely. And even any new IP that is developed, typically, I mean, it's always up to the company, you know, to have the conversation. Is it you or is it us? Typically, it's the company. Do I have some challenges that we face in implementation? Absolutely. So some of the challenges can be dirty data uh, or poor data. And sometimes what we have to do is we have to then take a look at how do we get that data? Is it that the, you know, it needs to be bought or brought in from somewhere else? Or is it that we need a period of time, whether it's you know, two weeks or two months, in order to get the clean data? Yeah, so that's one of the challenges, absolutely. Do you have any other questions on specific challenges that you have in mind? Okay, good, thank you.